Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the final program of 2021. Wow, what a year and how quickly has it gone? We'll do some reflections on the year at the end of the program. Now, as you know, it's just after 8.30 here uh, in the United Kingdom and we're live from the studios of British Muslim TV here in Wakefield with this week's edition of Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq. We're broadcasting on Sky Channel 752 and across social media at British Muslim TV, wherever you are around the world, joining us, a very warm welcome. We want you to comment on the big stories we're covering tonight. You can call us now on 01924-231-083 or message us on the WhatsApp number, which is on the screen now. Now, if you're watching this on Facebook, post your comment in the chat box and we'll read some of them on air later. Now, in tonight's programme, we'll head to Christchurch in New Zealand to talk to Aya Al-Umari, the sister of Shaheed Hussein Al-Umari, one of the victims of the Christchurch mosque terrorist attacks. We then head to London to reflect on the Bhopal gas disaster in 1984 with campaigner Martin Wright. And we finish off in Blackburn with Councillor Shoka Hussain as we review the year for the Labour Party in Keir Starmer. So we want to hear from you tonight. You can call us now on 01924 231 or message us on British Muslim TV across social media. Alternatively, yes, you guessed it, you can send us a WhatsApp message. The number is on the screen. I always tend to look at the screen on my right-hand side just to make sure the number is there, and it is there. You can see it there. Anyway, the questions we're considering here tonight. Islamophobia led to the terrorist attack in New Zealand. How do we defeat terrorism? What are your reflections on the Bhopal disaster in 1984? Got a powerful interview coming up with Martin Wright. And how do you review the year for Keir Starmer and the Labour Party? You can share your thoughts and questions on these by ringing us on 01924 231 083 or messages on WhatsApp or post on social media and we'll read some of your comments throughout the programme. OK, let's get started on our first story. The Christchurch mosque terrorist attack in March 2019 led to the brutal murder of 51 people, including children and women. Over 40 were injured and the terrorist was someone who hated Islam and Muslims and was a far-right extremist. Now, you recall, uh, you will recall, we spoke to the Imam of Al-Nur Mosque, Imam Ghamal Fuda, a few weeks ago. He himself was a survivor of that dreadful day. And on that day, as the Juma service was in full floor, the terrorist attack began and there was a chance for Hussein al-Umari to get away from the terrorist as he began shooting. Now, it would have obviously been the simplest human reaction to get away. And no one would have seen him any differently. But he didn't do that. Hussein rushed towards the terrorist, shouting at him to stop and in the process was killed. His family have been devastated by the attack. But what is life like now, two years on or so, or nearly three years on for the family? How are they coping? Aya al is the sister of Hussein. And rather than getting on with her life and rebuilding it, She's spending the time making sure that Hussein's memory and sacrifices live on. Pleased to say Aya Al-Umari is live on British Muslim TV from Christchurch in New Zealand. Uh, dear sister, Assalamu alaikum. A very warm welcome to the program. Thank you so much for honoring us with your presence. Uh, Wa alaikum salam. Good morning from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Thank yeah. you for having me. Well, for, for our viewers here in the UK and Europe to know that it's uh, 8.33 here. Yeah, in uh, Christchurch, uh, it's the morning. It's uh, 9.33. 13 hours ahead of us. Uh, so you've had a good rest, inshallah. Uh, first, yeah. first of all, tell us about Hussein. What was he like? Um, Hussein is, is uh, I mean, as you have highlighted, uh, the, he's, he's um, a brother that any, any sister can be very, very proud of. Um, he always puts uh, others, he always puts the needs of others um in front of his and that's how he lived his entire life and ultimately the last moments of his life um he's is very kind every like uh post post the terrorist attack we spoke to so many people and he's touched so many people's lives from all ages from kids to elderly um, to his neighbours, anybody um, that Hussein interacted with, they had a story to tell me about him, and it just makes me very, very proud of him. Um, always, yeah. Um, you grew up in the United Arab Emirates. 
uh, originally family's Iraqi from Iraq. Uh, when did you come to New Zealand and what was that first experience like? Yes, yes. So we, uh, me and Hussein are what you call third culture kids. So yes, we, we, um, we were born in Emirates to, um, to Iraqi parents and lived there for 10 years. And uh, we moved to New Zealand in 1997. So obviously, um, it's been all, yeah, it's, it, it, at the time that we arrived, it was, we were kids and it was, it was a big culture shock to us. So the schooling system, I cannot begin to imagine how it was for my mom, but for us, like the schooling system was different. The language was different. The accent was different. We, we actually were taught by British uh, teachers and, and um, yeah, the accent is very, very broadly, very uh, contrast. Like to give you an example, a 10 is a 10 in New Zealand <laughs> or, or a pen is a pen. So um, it was a yeah it was a big culture shock but um, we, we we are we are um, New, Z New, New Zealanders now yeah yeah and, and it's a very small community in comparison to say here in the UK big community big towns whereas in New Zealand it's quite a small and compact community. Uh, yes, I mean in New Zealand there is a big uh, uh, there is a strong sense of community. Yes, you are right. And in um, in the time in the time of of need, we uh, New Zealand we cut, everybody sort of assigns to themselves a role, and you just become one. And so we saw this um, not just in the terrorist attack, but we also saw it in the Christchurch earthquake, and we also had a um, uh, volcano eruption and um, yeah you saw this time and time again um, that New Zealand really comes we come together um, as a sense of our community we were very grateful for all um, post the terrorist attack we didn't even have to we didn't have to feed ourselves for a good month um, food parcels were coming in everybody was coming in doing the gardens even offering to do the washing we, it was, it was a, it, 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 it's a great feeling, yeah. Uh, what, what are your reflections on that Friday? Uh, refle reflections in terms of. Yeah, just, just what happened and how such a beautiful place like Christchurch, that something like this could happen. I mean, yes, you, um, we, we were. It was a beautiful day. Everybody was minding their own business. Hussein was minding his own business and praying. I was at work. It was the last thing that you expected. So even when I got a tap in the shoulder at work saying that there was a shooting in the mosque, I didn't I thought it was a joke. I thought it was a silly joke. Um and I didn't I didn't even believe it until my boss messaged me saying that there was a shooting in the mosque. And I said, okay. And that's when I checked the news and saw, okay, this is real. Um, Hussein, unfortunately, um, he he had suffered a lot of um, in racism in his previous work. So he, he left that looking for a job. So obviously he had nothing to do. So he went to the Friday prayers. And um, I didn't know because because it because he used to be full time. I didn't know whether he was in the mosque or not. Um, but when I called him, he didn't answer. For my parents, they were going to the mosque, and I went to uh, his house. We couldn't locate him, and slowly, slowly, it started daunting on us um, that he could have been there. And then. Um, uh, a couple of hours in, we heard the the stories about Hussein, and so the first one that we heard was him being um, him shouting at the terrorists, and then that's when, that's when I thought to myself, okay, yeah, you know what, I know that I know Hussein, he's not going to stand still, and I even texted my friends. My parents knew that he was not going to stand still, and so we had this feeling that he was he was going to do something about um about it he wasn't going to stand still but nevertheless there was this little glimpse of hope that he wasn't mm. there 
Um, now, it, it, but, yeah. sorry, it, it took six days for you to get confirmation of his death. He was the very last person who was confirmed as a victim. But you said you began mourning him on that day of the attack. What was the reaction from, you talked briefly about it, but neighbours, community, the Muslim world, um, to what was happening? Uh, yes, you're right. So we started, um, we actually started um, grieving about 24 to 48 hours later. Um, and so the stories that we heard of um, of the witness that saw him attack, shouting and the other one who saw him um, attack, uh, attacking, we, we just, you just know in your heart that he's no longer, no longer with us. And um, by by knowing how he acted in the past and knowing how he is, um, we just we just knew that he was no longer with us, and it's sort of this feeling amongst us um, that it, it's, it's going to torture us if we wait for the official confirmation, um, which we got six days later. A couple of days later, we also got um, a list, an unofficial list of the. Uh, injured people in the hospital. Um, there was rumours that there was other people in other hospitals, but we just figured this is this is it. This is it. Hussein is no longer with us. The reaction from family was was. Um, I mean, I, it was all a blur to be honest with you. But it was the love and support that we got was really really helped our journey to work our navigate through our our um our grief journey absolutely um, we're going to take a quick break um i i know you're going to stay with us a very short break and we'll continue this co important conversation uh, on reflections but if you've been affected by what we've talked about um please you can uh, get help there is help available you can log on to uh, britishmuslim.tv slap um slash support um, please uh, don't suffer in silence. I know it's a very difficult conversation that we're having with Aya. We'll take a quick break. We'll come back and have that important conversation. Uh, don't go anywhere. Join us on the other side with these important messages. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, welcome back to Questions with me, Mohamed Shifik, exclusively here on British Muslim TV, live from our studios here in Wakefield. Now, we're taking your calls now on 01924231083. You can get in touch with us on social media uh, at the handle British Muslim TV. Now, we've got an exclusive conversation with Aya Al Umari, who's my special guest, joining us live from Christchurch in New Zealand. Uh, Aya, before the break, you were telling me about the response to the attack from neighbours and community. Did your family? Or does your family take comfort the fact that he was killed in a mosque on the Jummah, which is a blessed day, and he was shaheed as well? Um, he died in, in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and, and, and he's no doubt uh, in, the, in heaven. Uh, 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 yes, absolutely. I mean, our, uh, our faith really, really played a big part in, in our uh, uh, Recover, recovery. I mean, there is the ayah in the Quran that um, that says, "Do not say those who have been killed in the way of Allah, Allah. that they are yeah. dead, they are That's alive, right. and they are rejo rejoicing with their Lord." And so, this, I, 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 um, I got sent this ayah from one of my friends, one of my old friends in the UAE, and it really, really brought some so it's some peace uh, in 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 our hearts. Um, that he is well looked after with, in, with 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 Allah, and it honestly, if it wasn't for our faith, we would have, we would have probably lost. We would have probably been very very lost, very angry, very. Um, we wouldn't know how to live our lives. But um, after the terrorist attack, my my faith in Islam actually grew stronger. And that was actually one of the messages I said to the terrorist himself when I was delivering my victim impact statement. I said to him, you were meant to divide us, but you actually, you failed. You made my, you, you, you know, you, you intended to, 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 to grow the hate 
um, about Islam, but you actually made people more aware about Islam and you made my faith in Islam even stronger. Mm. Yeah, and, and a few months after this, like you went to Umrah and then you went back to UAE, sort of yeah. re going through those memories that you had with Hussein, the places you went to, the home you lived in, just out, you stood outside and looked at the door. How important was that for you in terms of recovery and a healing process? It was, it was, um, it was very important. I mean, I've, I've been very, very blessed, alhamdulillah, to be given the opportunity to be given to, to go to Hajj, actually, um, in, in, um, in Saudi Arabia. And so um, I did the Umrah for um, Hussain first, uh, or for myself and then Hussain, and then I, I did the Hajj. But yeah, for, um, for Hussain's Umrah, I took his um, I took his picture around with me and then sent the um, on each landmark I sent photos back to back to my family to to sort of make them a part of my my journey and it was it was it was very helpful um, and it brought me close to close to God close to Hussein and um, to um, when we went back to when I went back to um, Abu Dhabi. I went back to Dubai, went back to Abu Dhabi. I was very, I was hosted by um, Emirates. I was very blessed again. And I took, yes, I took the journey to visit our old house, our old pool. It was, it, it, it sort of, it's sort of where it all started. I just wanted to see where my, the, the, um, the beginnings of my life, my childhood with Hussein was, was the most amazing childhood. And I just wanted to, to visit that, so it was it was very emotional, and I, um, but it was very helpful um, to go to go through that journey again in my adulthood because it helps my sad self take comfort in the fact that we lived a good life with Hussein, and inshallah we meet him in the afterlife. Inshallah, and you refer to the ayah from the Quran: "Wala takululi ma yuqtalu fi sabilillahi um, Beautiful ayah in the people who die in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're alive, really alive. And we can't really understand in what context they're alive. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that. Um, thank you for that. And you and your mother were recently subjected to a racist rant in a shopping mall after a stranger heard you talking amongst yourselves in Arabic. Um, how does that make you feel? How did you deal with that? Um... Basically, I mean, my pain in pre-terrorist attack, and I believe my pain of Islamophobia and racism is echoed all around the world. There is an entire generation who suffered in the last 20-odd years um, for, for being discriminated against. And I used to hide the fact that I was... Muslim or the fact that I was Arabic or Iraqi, and I just just to fearing the repercussions of how I'm going to be treated at work or in my friend's circle or whatnot. But after, uh, I mean, I was a kid when September 11 happened. And so after this terrorist attack happened, it sort of is a wake up call. Why am I, why am I embarrassed for who I am? Why am I embarrassed to talk Arabic? Why am I embarrassed about my faith? And so when somebody was really annoyed that we were talking in a different language than English, it really, really um, uh, hurt, hurted me because hate really grows. It grows. It starts really small. So, it, it, it's, so that terrorist had an ideology and he was being enabled by the media, by people being okay with it or laughing at his jokes or things like that and 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 it, it it really only takes one person to just call it out and hopefully make a stop to it and so i felt that i can't i can't just live my life being discriminated against and not say anything about it like i have in the past and so i called her out about it and i said to her what is wrong with that um and so it it was important to me to call out that racism, to call out that xenophobia, and make sure, um, it, you know, the, the 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 wrong actions are called on, 
And that's what I encourage everyone to do is don't tolerate discrimination. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to share with you, Aya, some of the comments we're getting through on social media. Very, very, very busy. Uh, Tiger uh, Wong says, Salam and love from Manchester, another city that was subjected to a terrorist attack. Um, Kleina Evans has said, uh, Salam, uh, Islam is all, uh, she says, such a forgiving woman, um, you were so kind, Islam is all peaceful and forgiving. Um, I am a Christian, but have respect for my Muslim brothers and sisters. And Tiger Wong says, I still get blamed for 9-11, even though I was two when it happened. Um, Shazara Mohammed says, Mashallah, may Allah make it easy for you and your family and grant you ease. Um, let's, you, you mentioned the terrorist when he was sentenced earlier on this year, you and your uh, family members, as with all the other family members, were present and were able to address the court. Your mother, uh, may Allah preserve her, Jannah uh, Izzat, uh, forgive him. And she made a mm -hmm. statement um, of forgiveness in front of him. Uh, was this was this something she discussed with you in the wider family? Uh, it was just a spontaneous act of forgiveness that she demonstrated uh, in the courthouse. It was it was spontaneous. Um, uh, we, we were. Um, I re I remember uh, thinking because I was going to speak after her, and I was rehearsing in my head what I was going to say. And then when she was reading her um, victim impact statement, put it aside and went to say and i honestly bless her she i am so amazed of my my mother the wonder woman and i feel that this forgiveness obviously it's forgiving but not forgetting so this forgiveness removes the burden from my mom's shoulder it removes the anger that's what she said she said she doesn't have hate in her she doesn't have anger in her the damage is done hussein is gone what good is it going to be to continue to hate? And so she, for, yeah, she forgave him, and the rest is the rest is up to Allah. Um, and and but in the meantime, I can see that this has really removed the burden off her shoulder, and um, we are just living in memories of of her saying with no no hate or no anger. And I'm absolutely absolutely amazed. Um, but yeah, it was it was not it was not um, discussed. It was definitely spontaneous, and I salute and commend my mom for this. Um, it it it. We actually were approached by um, one of the officers who actually said that the terrorist actually that he was very cold stone all throughout the day. But when my mom spoke, something spoke to him. Uh, but I mean, he is evil, but. It tells you the powerful world words that my mum had said. It just shook everyone, really. Yeah. How are you now? How's the family? We're nearly three years on. Um, we are. I mean, I I echo Imam Jamal Fuda's words. We are broken-hearted, but not broken. Um, we are. Um, we are as good as as um as good as we can be. Um, we, we are trying to move forward rather than move on. And so we're trying to, um, the city that we live in, we've lived in here since 1997. There's a lot of memories with Hussein. Hussein's school is down the road. The masjid is very nearby. The malls that we used to go to is nearby. And so we, we are going to, as part of our recovery journey, we are going to, to yeah. move, our intention was to move cities, but obviously with COVID happening, that that delayed this. But um, we'll start a new chapter in um, in a new city soon, inshallah. Um, we've got about sixty seconds left. I just wanted to ask the final question: How would you like the world to remember Hussein? By by being kind to others and yourself. Um, so tell my to my Muslim um, brothers and sisters, I know we have um, uh, hold your head up high and be proud of who you are. Your your actions are an ambassador to your faith. Um, be yourself, be kind to yourself. Don't tolerate hate. Call it out. And to the world, I say, hate speech is real. If there was anything, um, you need to call it out and um, put yourself. 
before others. No matter how busy you are during the day, put your family first. Take the time to 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 tell your family you love them, and that's definitely what he's saying was like. He put others before himself, and he would always tell me that he loves me and gives me big hugs. And so, I really want any brothers and sisters out there, please give each other some. Thank you. Some good hugs and good banter. Well, thank you so much, uh, Aya. Really powerful discussion there. You have my love uh, and I always pray for you and the family. My love, much love to your family. Thank you so thank much. You that was much. Aya Alomari, the sister of Hussein Alomari, the hero who confronted the terrorist in Christchurch Mosque. We'll take a very quick break and then we'll continue the programme. Join us on the other side of this. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq. Now, just before we move on to our next story, I just want to remind our viewers, if you were... It was a very traumatic conversation having to hear um, from Aya and the impact uh, the murder and the terrorist attack had on her and her family. But if you do need some support, you can log on to the BritishMuslim.tv slash support uh, for further advice. But yeah, thank you so much to Aya there for joining us. Uh, we are broadcasting live from our studios here in Wakefield. We'll take your calls now on 01924 231 If you want to share your thoughts about that interview uh, or our next conversation, please do get in touch with us on social media handles, British Muslim TV. Let's move on to our next story. Now, on the night of the 2nd of December 1984, the Union Carbide India Limited pesticide plant in Bhopal in Madhya Pradesh in India, there was a gas leak. It was considered the world's largest industrial disaster there are estimates 500,000 people were exposed to methyl isokinite uh, MIC gas. Now, there are various estimates on the death toll. The official immediate death toll was placed at 2,259. But the government of Madhya Pradesh, the provincial government, paid compensation to the family members of 3,787 victims who were killed in the gas release and to 574,366 people who were injured. Now, uh, Martin uh, Wright uh, is a former, I've just lost, uh, my screen is frozen, but um, Martin Wright is the former head of the Howard League for Prison Reform. He's an early advocate of restorative justice. He's the founder of the Restorative Justice for Bhopal campaign. And I'm pleased to say he joins us live from his home in London, uh, Martin, a very warm welcome to the programme. Thank you so much uh, for joining us this evening. Thank you very much for asking me. Uh, tell us, what, what was the Bhopal disaster and what happened? You've just given a very good summary of it. Uh, it was uh, in 1984, the Union Carbide Corporation of America had been setting up a pesticide plant and it wasn't doing very well. And so they cut back on various safety measures and the inevitable happened, and there was this disastrous leak of very poisonous gas called methyl isocyanate, and it immediately killed, within the next few days, something like 8,000 people, and the total death toll was something like 20,000. So, as you rightly say, it's probably the worst industrial accident there's ever been. And the, the big scandal is that it hasn't been cleared up that the people who live nearby are still suffering the after effects, both those who are directly affected at the time and also um, those who live nearby because the company that was responsible left the site, they abandoned it, covered with poisonous chemicals which have been leaking into the water supply. And this is continuing to make people ill. And perhaps the worst thing of all is that the number of babies who are being born with birth defects has, is about seven times the, the normal rate. And uh, that is a complete denial of their human rights, if ever there was one. Yeah, I was just going to say that there is some confusion. I mean, when I was doing the research for the programme, we talked about the 3,000 or so people who were uh, compensated but there are also the numbers you talked up to, 11,000. Why is there such a discrepancy uh, between the official figure and the figure that you're talking about? Uh, we would very much like to know, but uh, it does seem that there's some problem of defining who is eligible. Uh, and 
uh, the official figures. They, the, the officials do seem to have slanted the figures in favor of the corporation to make them as, as low as possible. And therefore, people who, uh, who've been permanently uh, injured uh, are classed as temporarily injured, and therefore they got less compensation. So there's a lot of things of that kind have been going on. But the, the most important thing, uh, two, two things, one is to clear up the site so that it doesn't go on poisoning people, and the other is to look again at the compensation. Yeah, because there's lots of, uh, lots of people would think it was a long time ago, 1984, mm. but people are still suffering the after effects 27 years later. That's right, that, that is the great scandal. And the, the company responsible was the Union Carbide Corporation. They were taken over in 2001 by the Dow Chemical Company, and they have denied liability as well. They say we weren't running the plant when the accident happened. But the fact remains that they took over the company which was responsible. They knew that it was responsible. And they've found various legal reasons for saying that it, it, it wasn't their liability. Uh, Martin, I mean, obviously, you're a formal head of the Howard League for Prison Reform. You're an activist of a distinguished record, if I may put it like that. Where did your interest come in in championing this campaign? It was really from an advertisement by the Bhopal Medical Appeal, because 10 years after the disaster in 1994, uh, uh, an appeal was set up to set up a clinic to treat the people who are suffering uh, in many ways, but different organs of their bodies, some of them were blinded, some of them had liver damage, lung damage, and so on, and they, ne they needed urgent medical attention. And so a clinic was set up, and the appeal uh, tried to raise funds for it. And they put out a full-page advertisement in the Guardian newspaper, and um, that got a good response and enabled them to set up the clinic. Yeah, we're going to talk a bit more about the clinic in, in a second. But we know that in 2010, Martin, uh, an Indian court convicted former senior employees of the Union uh, Carbide in, uh, Indian subsidiary, and they were charged and convicted of causing death by negligence for their part in the tragedy. Is that enough justice for the victims and this cause, or do you think there needs to be more prosecution and more investigation? No, by no means enough, because uh, for one thing, they were prosecuted and convicted. They got relatively light sentences, uh, and they were then released on bail pending appeal, and the appeal has still not been heard. And secondly, the people who were convicted were all Indians, and none of the uh, Americans responsible were brought to court. Yeah, and, and obviously there's, there's the issue. What, what do you make of the... Indian government and their inability to bring closure to this particular issue? I don't know if inability is the right word. They certainly haven't done so. Uh, and it, it does look as if they have been taking, uh, taking the side of the company rather than of their, their own citizens. And that's particularly why, um, why I was, uh, I think, invited to come on tonight, because many of the people involved were Muslims uh, others were belonged to the uh, Dalit class, the so-called untouchables, and both of those are groups which do not get a very high priority from the Indian government. But what the Indian government does seem to want is more investment by transnational corporations. And, and you do think it was, uh, in terms of what you just mentioned about the different aspects of Indian society, where we do see a large increasing level of Islamophobia and bigotry towards uh, lower caste communities. Do you think that played a part in this disaster and the aftermath? I don't know if it played a part in the disaster, but in the aftermath, certainly it does seem to be part of the reason why the, the problem has been neglected for so long. Because the criticism is not just of the current government of Narendra Modi, it goes back to 1984 and there's been Congress uh, governments as well, so po to both parties, in effect, are responsible for what has happened over the last 27 years? It looks like that, because 
over that, that period, the survivors have campaigned as hard as they can. They tried the criminal law and they didn't get anywhere because the company wouldn't appear in court, apart from those uh, Indian executives whom you mentioned. Uh, and they've tried the civil law. They got compensation, which was grossly inadequate. And it, it was only a, a few hundred dollars per person for, for a death and even less for, for injury. And uh, so they, they resorted to protest. And three times they marched the 500 kilometers from Bhopal to Delhi to try and see the, the prime minister at the time. And they, they got a certain number of promises. Uh, the, the prime minister was not very keen to see them. Uh, and when he eventually did see them, made some promises, and they have not been kept. And, and what, can, what can the British government and uh, other international partners do to continue to highlight this? The British government could uh, let it be known, I think, that we are, of course, very anxious to, to be trading partners with, with India, but not, not on any terms, that uh, we're, we're very glad to trade with people who have a, a good res regard for human rights. And uh, that human rights are singularly neglected or ignored in, in the Bhopal situation. And have you had conversations? I mean, because you're somebody who, if you look at British history in terms of judicial reform, if you look at, you know, the interest of the, I would argue, the working class people and the lower people in society, you've always been a great advocate for that work. How important is your involvement in this campaign to raise as a profile? Well, we, we do what we can, and we've been trying to interest uh, influential people. And uh, there, there are uh, people of Indian heritage in Parliament, for example, uh, who we, we would hope would have some sympathy with the, uh, the plight of the people in Bhopal. So in, anything we can do to attract attention to the problem and to get something done, uh, we would certainly like to do. And uh, we think that the, the Indian government, as I said, it tends to be, uh, to, to be on the side of the big corporations, and perhaps it's the big corporation which could uh, really influence it. Because if they said, uh, we want to invest in you, we don't want to be so unpopular that people are unwilling to do business with us, uh, and therefore we'd like the, the Indian government to, uh, to take some action and to help us to take action, then we think that it would be in everybody's interest, not only the people of Bhopal, but the company itself. And uh, we are encouraged by this, uh, by the fact that uh, more and more people are paying attention to corporate social responsibility and uh, the, the idea that companies should not only be out to make a profit, but they should have responsibility. Yeah, should have a moral uh, compass as well. Martin, I know you're going to stay with us. We just need to take a very quick break. And uh, when we come back, we'll continue this important conversation with Martin Wright on the Bhopal gas disaster in 1984. Don't go anywhere. We'll see you very shortly after these quick messages. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq, exclusively here on British Muslim TV, live from our studios here in Wakefield. Now, we're taking your calls on 01924 231 083. We've got lots, lots of messages. Uh, about the IR uh, al Umari interview, but also about the Bhopal uh, gas disaster. We'll get through some of them very shortly. But I mean, meanwhile, uh, if you want to share your thoughts as well, and if you're on social media, uh, just post your comments on that Facebook Live uh, post, and we'll get through some of them shortly. Martin Wright is still my special guest, joining us live from London. Now, Martin, you're nearly 92. Most people at your age would be relaxing, retired, what is it that keeps you going and looking so good, my family says so? I think it's the, the injustice of what's happening in Bhopal that I feel as having become aware of it, knowing that so much needs to be done and so little is being done, that um, anything that, that can be done ought, ought to be. And that if 
I hope I can get people younger and more energetic and generally talented than me to take it on and let's hope get get the job done. Yeah, because you mentioned before the break that Bhopal uh, medical uh, appeal, which has been supported by so many British donors, many people, thousands have given towards that. What have they actually helped to do? Sorry? The Bhopal medical appeal, what, what has it succeeded to do? Uh, well, mainly it has, it has raised the money to enable the clinics to keep going. They were started because the people who founded them were awarded a, a, a prize called the Goldman Prize, and that gave them some capital, but they need to keep going. Uh, and uh, the Bhopal Medical Appeal also does what publicity it can. It is slightly constrained by the, the laws relating to charities, uh, which are not allowed to get too political. <laughs> but uh, they, the, the main thing they do is to keep... The, the, there are now two clinics, one called Sambhavna and one called Chingari, which is especially for children, and both of these need continuous support. Um, and uh, that appeal is still live so many years later, still important, still relevant in 2021. That's the sad thing about it, yes. And they, they've been very active. One thing they've done is to react to the COVID crisis, because as if it wasn't enough already, people who are affected by the, the gas leak uh, are also especially susceptible to the, to the COVID virus and many of them have sadly died. And uh, so it, it, all this skill that they've built up over the years is being applied uh, in the local community to try and help people to minimize the effects of COVID. Um, and what do you make of, we talked earlier on about the government response, the Indian government response, but what steps do, would, does Narendra Modi and his government need to take to kind of bring closure this particular issue? One would hope that they would, they would want to, because uh, the, the trouble is that uh, we think that for various historical reasons, the Indian government doesn't always welcome intervention from this country, but um, we do hope that they will listen to uh, people of, of goodwill wherever they come from, uh, so that they will realize that it's, it's in the interests of the Indian reputation, the company's reputation as well, uh, to, uh, as you say, to, to put closure on the whole event and to let people get on with living the rest of their lives. Now, in 1994, the International Medical Commission on Bhopal held um, a conference in Bhopal, and their work contributed to long-term health effects being officially recognised. How important was that intervention? Uh, I think it helps, but uh, it doesn't seem to have uh, made it, uh, uh, to have emphasised enough the prevention aspect of it, that uh, certainly the people who are suffering, uh, who have symptoms, uh, need medical help. But the long-term aim must always be prevention is better than cure, and therefore we need to prevent more people being becoming ill because of the the contamination of the water supply. You could say that there have been two disasters. The gas leak was the first, and the continuing disaster of the pollution of the local water is the second. And that, that the first one is over and done with. We're just seeing the after effects now. But the water pollution is going on, and it is spreading, mm. and it needs to be stopped from spreading. Um, and what do you make of the fact that in February 2012, uh, WikiLeaks leaked um, that there was intelligence uh, research organization Stratfor um, that revealed that Dow Chemical, which is a which is a parent company, had engaged Stratfor to spy on the public and personal lives of the activists involved in the Bhopal disaster. Sorry, what was the question? I'm just saying, what did you make of the fact that there were allegations denied by the company? that they uh, were spying on the activists and journalists who were involved in highlighting this issue? Well, we, we don't have any firm information about that, but uh, we, we do suspect it. And we feel that the, 
the Dow company has simply not not played fair in the, the way it is continuing to, to to deny and also to try and prevent uh, people from publicizing the facts which are yeah. uh, very very well known and plain for everybody else to see yeah because Stratfor, which is the company that was accused of carrying out the surveillance of activists and journalists they at the time um had released a statement condemning the revelations by WikiLeaks, and they didn't neither confirm or deny the allegations or deny the accuracy of the reports. And that they would only say that they um, had acted uh, within the bounds of the law. And Dow Chemical, which is a parent company, as we said, it also refrained to comment on that particular aspect of the WikiLeaks story. Um, and then you had a number of activists who were refused entry, who were refused visas by the Indian government. What, what impact does that have on the international movement? To keep this highlighted. Yes, um, well, that's another of the actions by the Indian government, which we, we find hard to hard to explain. And um, we do one of the things they have done also is to make it difficult to conduct a feasibility study, just to say what would it take to clear up the, uh, the uh, poisoned land, uh, and, it could, and it could be an independent inquiry by the United Nations Environmental Programme, for example, and they have blocked that because they want it to be done by, by Indian scientists. And we, we cast no aspersions on the competence of Indian scientists, but in a thing like this, it's important for it to be seen to be independent and uh, therefore, it, it should not be uh, prevented by the Indian government. And is it your case, Martin, that you're not just campaigning for justice for the victims of the Bhopal disaster 27 years on, but also to put in place the safeguards so that nothing like this happens again, either in India or anywhere else in the world? Indeed, that's very important. And the that one of the things the survivors want is that there should be no more Bhopals. And uh, we have been wondering whether to extend the campaign, not only to Bhopal, which is the, the worst example and probably the longest running, but also other examples of dumping toxic waste, which is done by numerous companies, mining companies and others around the world. And uh, that uh, that should be on the agenda for those who want to save the planet. But climate change is very important, but the dumping of toxic waste is poisoning it forever. Yeah, it's, and, and it's, what is really fascinating about this, uh, researching for our time together and realise that even now it's still going on, that campaign, there's a big campaign, a 37-day campaign by the survivors of the disaster uh, in India asking... Uh, why the CBI, which is the prosecutor, Central uh, Bureau of Investigation, in terms of India, um, are, are not looking at the criminal part of, of, of the case, but also uh, looking at that corporate irresponsibility. What can happen now to make sure something like this doesn't happen? What safeguards can any company make? Um, it's simply the... Um the importance of safety procedures and of inspections and controls. There are some governments which are in favour of light touch regulation, and light touch regulation, unfortunately, uh, tends to mean that uh, situations like the one which led to the Bhopal disaster uh, get passed over. And the number of inspectors is too few, their powers are too small, and uh, one of the campaigns which is going on at the moment is that there should be a, a new crime called ecocide, which is killing the environment, and the dumping of toxic waste would come under this. And uh, we don't know what the chances are of getting it adopted internationally, but that would certainly help so that people who committed these crimes really had to answer for them. United you, sir. You've been an activist pretty much your whole life. Um, we want to wish you well, sir. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a good Christmas and keep safe, sir.
Thank you very much. And anybody who can help, we'd be glad to hear from them. Yeah, and how can people get in touch with you, sir? Sorry? How can people get in touch with the campaign? Uh, through the, the website, uh, Action for Bhopal. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, there, Martin Wright. Um, thank you so much. Right, let's give you the latest update of what's happening in terms of COVID. Obviously, the Prime Minister made that statement yesterday. That was a short video from Downing Street saying there was going to be no further restrictions in England. Remember, in Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland, there's a devolved, health is devolved. So therefore, local decision making is up to the relevant uh, governments in them three countries. But in England, the Prime Minister said he was not going to make any drastic changes to the rules before Christmas. But he did not rule out. He actually hinted that something might happen after. We've had lots of uh, medical uh, and scientific data that's come through Omic uh, Omicron wave, apparently based on the evidence so far. This is a Scottish study. We can talk about it just after the break. Um, says that the early evidence suggests that people are needing hospital treatment um, but the numbers are a lot lower than we thought in terms of the pressure on the NHS. But we'll keep an eye on this as we get through uh, the coming weeks. Whatever you do, make sure you get boosted. Right, we're going to take a break and then talk about Keir Starmer and the Labour Party, their year in 2021. Don't go anywhere. Join us on the side of this. Assalamualaikum, welcome back to Questions with me, Mohamed Shafi. Now, just before the break, we were talking about the NHS, uh, Omicron, and the impact that it's having. Obviously, the latest data is from uh, University of Strathclyde, uh, but they're still looking into the data. It's too early to say. So, in essence, whatever the government decides, we, you and me, and everybody else has to be played careful. So, wear your mask where you have to protect yourself and your families. And when you get a chance, please get your booster. And if you haven't had a first or second job, where have you been? Make sure you get yourself protected. Anyway, let's move on to our final story tonight. Keir Starmer became leader in the midst of the pandemic, while initial polls were promising and kind to him because he brought a different type of politics. They reverted to the normal practice, which is trailing the Conservatives. There was a vaccine bounce for Boris Johnson throughout 2021. And a few weeks ago, we reflected uh, on the Conservative and the Boris Johnson. But recent activities around Christmas parties, Salih's allegations and the rise of another variant has seen Labour establish a six to eight point lead in various polls. But with a general election not expected until 2023 or 2024, can Keir Starmer and the Labour Party sustain this? Councillor Shokat Hussein is a senior Labour councillor in Blackburn. He's a regular contributor on my show here on British Muslim TV. Pleased to say, joining us live from Blackburn, across the border in Lancashire. Councillor Shokot Hussein, Salaam alaikum. Welcome to the programme. Alaikum Salaam and good evening to all your viewers. Um, thank you for having me on. I was just reflecting during the break. You're looking very good, mashallah. Thank you. Yeah. I do genuinely, be I do genuinely mean that, sir. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. I just you might be a bit hesitant to take compliments. Now, normally politicians don't get compliments, do they? They get a host of excuses and they get a host of insults and uh, why have you done this and why have you done that? So I'm going to be kind to you tonight because it's, uh, it's, it's the last programme of the year. Okay, thank you very much for that. But I think that's part and parcel of politics. It, it is indeed. Right, tell us, how do you assess a 2021 for Keir Starmer and the Labour Party? Well, if I'm going to be honest, it's been a very difficult year. Uh, it's been very challenging. And when Keir Starmer became leader, if you remember, it was in the middle of the pandemic and we had lockdown restrictions. So you couldn't have the normal first speech in front of the members or the public. And you had to be a recorded, televised thing um, that was shared between the membership. So he didn't have that hoo-ha opening speech that I think he would have loved. He couldn't have that interaction with people so it was difficult. And on top of that, I don't know if people remember, it was the day Boris Johnson got admitted to hospital with coronavirus. So it took his thunder away, really. And it was very difficult. 
And to some extent, the pandemic effectively shut down politics as we know it. So we couldn't even have the normal debates we have in Parliament, um, asking questions. A lot of that was um, on the internet, you know, live chats and um, through Zoom and uh, Teams. So he hasn't had it easy. It's been very difficult to to engage first time. But on the bright side, we were 20 points behind when he took over. We're now six to eight points ahead at this moment in stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Two years, two years. To an election, do you think he can sustain well, that? Um, I hope so. I think so. I think we're on the up. Um, the Tories, I, I can't see it lasting till 2024. I yeah. don't think Johnson is going to survive next year. I think, but he has got an ATC majority, he has, he has, so he's got a mandate from the British people for the rest of the parliament. He has, but I think, um, the Christmas parties, if you remember this time last year, Shafiq. A lot of people were going and suffering. A lot of people died. A lot of people were ill. A mm. lot of people couldn't celebrate. They couldn't meet people. I can give my personal example. I had five or six people die in my extended family. And we couldn't go to the funerals. I know, and their loved ones couldn't be with their them last In their loved morning. ones in the final moments. Absolutely. You know, and when you look back, and now you find out, and actually the fact um, that they were actually having parties in Downing Street and the mm. Prime Minister's, you know, Downing Street, and he was part of that. Um, it's absolutely uh, makes a mockery of everything. Yeah. And it just, uh, you know... Well, to, be, to be fair to the Prime Minister, he's, he's obviously ordered an investigation. Uh, Sue Gray's uh, investigation is ongoing. Apparently, according to various ministers, it's going to be released imminently. So we'll have to see what happens with that report. But then how do you assess... Keir Starmer and the Labour Party, because he's been accused of not providing any opposition. He well, argues that it's his patriotic duty to support these new restrictions, and he's done that for the whole year. Do you think he's got a balance right with being opposition just for opposition's sake and just supporting these uh, restrictions, recent restrictions? It's been very difficult. Um, it's, it's, people are dying. It's a national thing pandemic and we've got to seem to be united so we have supported the government in good faith but that's what I'm saying I think that benefit of that that Boris Johnson was getting the government was getting is wearing very thin now and people have started to realize that you know when we were supporting them blindly and we had to you know they got the vaccine rollout and they got a huge um, boost from that in the elections and the local elections but, yeah. you know, we have to support is a patriotic thing to do, to unite the country, to seem, you know, a united front. In, in, Flying in, the flag as he, was, as he was doing. But why did he only have one flag? Sorry? Why not, why not two Union Jacks next to him? Yes. Why just oh. one? <laughs> no, you'll have to ask him that. Um, no, no, I w I'd love to ask him. Uh, yeah. Anyway, just stay there, uh, Councillor Shokat. We, we've got a caller, Mohammed Shafak, joining us. Asalaamu As Alaikum. Waalaikum salam. Yes, brother. What would you like to say? Uh, yeah, I'm I'm one of the Labour Labour Party. I, I do uh, voting normally. Okay. Normally. Okay. Thank Hello. You. Yes, sir. We listen to you. What would you like to say? I heard it. What do you make of Keir Starmer's leadership in 2021? Uh, lockdown going to be in it. They're going to be doing lockdown in January. I don't want that to happen. <laughs> OK, thank you very much for your call. Um, uh, obviously, real concern about uh, lockdown. Yeah, it's going to be tough. It's, you know, this is... I mean, Shoka, let me talk to you. I mean, you were, you're were from Blackburn. You had a big, massive, you know, impact, not just on your community, but the whole country. We're all tired of it. We're tired of restrictions. But what else would you want to do? I mean, when I look at the 100 Conservative MPs who voted against the recent restrictions, I just said to them, what would you do? Would you just let this virus spread across the community? What would you say to those Conservative MPs? Look, we're listening to the medical experts, the doctors, the scientific advice we're getting. And, you know, we're actively promoting vaccines. Um, I'm actually, I've, I've had the booster now. And I'd say anybody who gets the chance to go down and have the booster, because that's the only way out of it. And, you know, it's probably going to be a yearly thing. Uh, I can see that, I can sort of accept that. But, you know, 
it's funny because I was having this conversation not so long ago and the way people see it is the ones who haven't had vaccine are waiting for people who had the vaccine to die and the ones who had the vaccine are waiting for people who haven't had the vaccine to die. And it's a sad state of affairs, but it is, isn't it? It still sort of seems to be, but you've got to go with the scientific advice. Okay, so Ke Keir Starmer's been accused. Sorry, I'm cutting you off because we've got not long yeah. till our break and I really don't get as many questions your way without throwing the pen at you. I'm not throwing the pen at you, promise you. Keir Starmer has been accused of being posh and out of touch with working class people. What would you say to that accusation from someone on the left of the Labour Party? I don't think it's true. Uh, he's, he's obviously had his work cut out. We've got a mountain to climb if you're going to win the next general election. So he's going to try and get back the waters we lost in 2019. Some through Brexit and some, you know, um, he's going to make hard choices. But this pandemic has made it that much more difficult because he can't engage. He can't go out there or as much as he wanted to go out there and meet people face to face. And that's sort of been a barrier. And I think that's where the challenges are. And hopefully in a few months time, we might turn the corner and we might get out there more and get to see people firsthand, get the points over. Yeah, and, and the, the opposition parties after what happened in North Shropshire last week where the Liberal Democrats took that seat, uh, of Owen Patterson and the sleaze allegations and the parties which you referred to earlier on. Opposition parties are now claiming that these are the dying days of the Boris Johnson government. What would you say? Well, I, I said that earlier. I can't see Boris lasting that long, to be honest. And I can see a challenge in the very near future. I think a few people are waiting for possibly this... Uh, <laughs> A virus to die down a bit, and then I think uh, there's going to be some questions asked. And after that, I can't see him wait until 2024. I just can't see that happening. Mm. Now, um, a few weeks ago, we had Iftikhar Ahmed looking at and reflecting on the Conservatives and Prime Minister Boris Johnson's time in office. And I asked him a question about Labour and the leader of the opposition. So I'm going to return the favour to you as well. How do you assess the Prime Minister Boris Johnson year in office? I think in all honesty, uh, like I said, mostly we've given the benefit of doubt because of the pandemic. Um, but in reality, I think he's been a shambles. He's missed so many Cobra meetings. He's not missed, missed his cheese and wine meetings, but he's missed Cobra meetings, which, you know, as the prime minister, you've got to be at the forefront. You've got to be there. And some of the allegations that are coming through from Cummings and Associates, it's just, I can't see him lasting, to be honest. You know, that that uh, newish, when you come over, jack the lad sort of thing, is wearing thing now. People are just seeing... Do you think the shine's through. wearing off? It because has, I, for many Conservative uh, MPs who I talk to, the, the fact that he was a vote winner, he won twice in London, which is generally seen as a Labour city, and then in the general election, he connected with people. Um, whatever his shortcomings, people sensed they wanted him. And that, 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 we talked about this during the general election campaign, didn't we? Uh, yes. We did. And, and that slogan, get Brexit done, resonated with many constituencies. But you uh, think you think that's now wearing thin? It is. I think, you know, there's a mixture. A lot of stuff that's coming through Brexit has been um, palmed off as COVID or the pandemic. I think sooner or later people realise that actually Brexit has took its toll. Um, when I work, we struggle with deliveries now. And we haven't got the wagon drivers. You can't get the deliveries out. You can't get the deliveries in. I'm sure if we're struggling, there'll be many other companies. And this is down to not having enough wagon drivers. Um, so all these will impact. And at some stage, they'll come together. You can see inflation rising as it is. Mm. Yeah, but we'll be... Reflecting uh, on what's going to happen, I know you're going to stay with us, Shokat, as we reflect on the coming year as well, 2022, as the Labour Party uh, tries to cement those poll leads. Um, so we'll have those quick, uh, we'll have we'll have those quick, important messages. We'll then uh, come back and have those conversation. The final final part of this last program in 2021. And then we'll do some reflections. Join us on either side of this.
And welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq. My special guest is Councillor Shokat Hussain, the Labour Party. And I mean, my script, it says the Labour Party leader is clearly not the Labour Party leader, but is a supporter of the Labour Party leader. I hope, are you still a supporter of uh, Keir Starmer? Yeah, he's the leader now. I'm, so. just, I'm just pulling your legs, sir. Right. Um, let's open the lines as well. Let's take some of your calls, 01924 Now, one of the biggest things that uh, uh, opposition MPs are talking about is the border and immigration bill. Uh, we saw Imran Hussain, the MP for Bradford East, uh, direct that question to Prime Minister in PMQs. What's your, what's your thinking around, uh, around that particular bill and how the opposition is handling opposition? Well, actually, I saw that uh, speech by Imran Hussain, and I think it was a very powerful speech. And I think he was very accurate, to be honest. Um, that's how a lot of people feel now, second-class citizens. Um, basically, that's what they've done. So if you, particularly if you happen to be a person of colour, you no longer enjoy being a British citizen. Can, do, you, do, you know, do you know, honestly, just a genuine question, do you know who actually brought in the first rules to take away people's citizenship? Go on. No, I don't. It was the Labour Party. Yeah, but then you must have had a right to appeal. I can understand people... But they have uh, still, according to the Home Office, they've still got right of appeal. What the, what the concern is that uh, they won't be given pre-notice. No. Uh, they wouldn't be given notice in advance so that they could then start a campaign uh, for justice as such. But, but the fact that the Labour Party now complaining about this, it was the Labour Party that started this slippery slope. Well, I, I, I haven't read that, but I'll say this much, that if it was the Labour Party, you would have a right to appeal and you'd have the right to be assessed in the court in England or UK. I don't think um, what they did with Shemai Begum was it? Whatever she did, and, you know, I don't condone her or anything, I think she should have been tried in this country. And just not letting her back in is, is something like, I don't know, you, Mohammed, might go to Pakistan, for example. Um, somebody might report you going to some sort of a mosque or a heritage centre or something or other. And an allegation, and you could, your citizenship could be stripped before you know it. Because mm. the Rooney the Me Trust is... Has, has described this as creating a two-tier citizenship. Does that concern you? Absolutely. That's what I said in my opening statement, that, you know, it's a second-class citizenship, really. Um, and, you know, somebody who... There's a lot of people who think just because they're born here it doesn't affect them. Actually, it does, because um, they will obviously find a link, whether it's through your parents or grandparents, and stress that they can send you back somewhere. I just feel people just, I just don't feel comfortable with it. You know, I, I've lived here, abided by the rules, worked most of my life, educated here, and all of a sudden you don't feel part of Britishness, and that, that can't be right. Yeah, and we know that the bill is now uh, in the House of Lords, and we'll see uh, the process of that. Um, as I said, the lines are open now, 01924 Um Now, in the midterm of this parliament, which we're at, you would think, two years in, you would think the opposition party would be taking seats in by-elections. But it's the Liberal Democrats that are doing that, not the Labour Party. Is that an indication of what is going to come in the next general election? I think voters are getting a lot wiser now. They want the Tories out. So a lot of tactical voting was gone in North Shropshire. That's just a given. I think you know a lot of Labour supporters went and supported. If you think that Tory seat, the Tories held that for over 200 years, and the only way they were going to get shut of them was by tactical voting. And I, I can honestly see a lot of that happening in the future. Um, so I, I won't say necessarily it's a bad thing. I think it just makes people more mm. uh, MPs more active. They're going to have to do a lot more and engage, and they can't, you know, these seats of whichever party. Because mm. you, you lost Hartipool. Yeah, but you just won about that. won Batley and Spen. Uh, you, 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 you didn't win uh, all Bexley and Sidcup. You didn't win Chesham and Amersham, which the Liberal Democrats took. 
and you didn't win North Shropshire. It's not a pretty good record, is it, under Keir Starmer's leadership? Well, I think battling Spen was a turning point for us. It, it, it what, you then went on and lost another three elections? No, 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 I just said to you, uh, North Shropshire, the last election I was following, and there was a lot of tactical voting going on there. And I think, to some extent, I think Labour were quite happy to lend their vote to the Lib Dems just to get the Tories out. Yeah, forgetting how, how much the Labour Party detests the Liberal Democrats, but maybe that's for another day. Uh, what do you make of the continued suspension of Jeremy Corbyn from the Parliamentary Party? Whereas you look at Joe Biden in the United States, the reason he won was because he kept uh, Bernie Sanders and the left close to him. Yet Keir Starmer's made a decision to keep Jeremy Corbyn as far as away from the Parliamentary Labour Party um, and his accusations that the continuous attacks on the left of the party uh, will cost him power at the next election. What do you make of that? Well, from what I've heard and from read is that I think Jeremy Corbyn was undermining uh, Keir Starmer, and which is why he suspended him from the... Because he's still a Labour member, the NEC brought him back, but I think um, he felt he was being Well, the reason... Sorry, I'm just correcting you. The, the reason he was kicked out was because Keir Starmer wasn't happy with the statement that he had made in the aftermath of that anti-Semitism report that was released. Um, he'd been cleared by the party's NEC, <laughs> but he's not been allowed back into the Parliamentary Labour Party because Keir Starmer says... Uh, he need, he he knows what he needs to do to do that. Uh, I don't know what the, you know. You you could read into that. I, but I, the, the wider the the wider issue, um, Shawkat, of you know having a diverse, united party. He's going to go in this. He's going to go into the next election, the leader of a divided party, because many on the left do not support him for what he's done to uh, Jeremy Corbyn. I think there's a section uh, who are not happy. I won't say the whole. Um, but he's got to address that, hasn't he? That's down to care to sort that out. One of his pledges to the party when he was uh, going through the leadership election was that he would unite the party. And he's on track for that because he's trying to win back waters we lost in Brexit. Um, so it's not easy. It's going to be difficult. But, you know, you can... But he's not divided. He's not, he's not, he's not united he's, the party. But the party is more divided now than it's ever been. Uh, I don't think so. If you remember when Corbyn was in uh, the leader, then the the right felt they were being excluded, mm. put to sidelines. So it's to and fro. Yeah. But it's not necessarily a bad thing. I think the Tories are going through similar things. Um, they're divided as well. So uh, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah. But but that adage, which is divided parties never win elections, <laughs> the Labour <laughs> Party is divided, sir. Well, you accept that? No, I accept there's a fraction that are... Which, is, which, 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 which means it's a divided party. Yeah, yeah, I accept that. But then I also accept that, you know, uh, Keir is going to have to face these challenges. In this yeah. Thing. Now, yeah. When, you look, when you look at 2022, it yeah. will be a pivotal year for the Labour Party. It needs to start getting its policy ready, thinking about that general election campaign, thinking about the manifesto... What's your views around, not, I don't want to really talk about the manifesto, but generally, how do you see the year playing out for Keir Starmer? Well, we've got, um, there's a lot of suggestions being floating about the policy forums coming around, each CLP is putting their bits forward. We've already got stuff about policing where we want to reintroduce neighbourhood policing again. Um, Education, we want to scrap the charitable status for private schools and put that money into um, public schools. Um, so we've got plans. We've got the climate change three. three we want to invest $3 billion in the Green Fund. Uh, economy, we want to scrap the business rates and introduce new, more fairer rates. So there's stuff that we need to put meat on, but, you know, we're floating about with policies. And like you say, we'll have a manifesto ready for the next election. Now, a uh, final question to you. Uh, how do you spend the Christmas period? Obviously, as Muslims, we don't celebrate Christmas, but it's a great opportunity to get tied with family. How do you spend your holiday period? Well, as, as you say, it's, uh, we don't celebrate as such, but luckily this time around, I've got two weeks off. Um, also, it's my grandson's birthday, which gives us a good opportunity to get together. All the kids come together and we have a party. So we have a gathering 
Um, I, I didn't know you were old enough to be a grandfather. You look... I am. I am. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I am. Do you know I'm, I'm going to charge you yeah. for all these compliments? <laughs> yeah. thank, well, thank you so much uh, for joining us. I know uh, I found that really useful. Yeah. Um, was... I hope whatever you do, you enjoy yourself and, and keep safe, my friend. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me and Allah Hafiz. Allah Hafiz. Always oh, a pleasure. Councillor Shokat Hussain, who is a senior cabinet member in Blackburn uh, with Darwin Council, uh, reflecting on the year for Keir Starmer and the Labour Party. And obviously, key question there, which you would ask of the Labour Party is, is the party united? Have they... Has Keir Starmer done enough to convince the voters that he really has changed the Labour Party so that he'll be more appealing to some of those former Labour seats, which is his strategy? Uh, or by continuously attacking the left and making sure Jeremy Corbyn is not returned to the Parliamentary Party, does that mean the Labour Party is divided and goes into that election divided, which will allow the Conservatives and the Tories to win? It's a really fascinating conversation. Um, OK, that was Councillor Shokat Hussein, as we said, joining us. Now, we've reached the end of the programme and the last of our programmes in 2021. Firstly, I want to thank our special guests tonight, Aya Alomari, Martin Wright and Councillor Shokat Hussein. Now, as we enter the Christmas and New Year break, we take a break. Yes, we're all entitled to a break now and again, even TV presenters and a production team uh, next week. We're not here next week. We'll be back on our screen on Wednesday, the 5th of January. 2022. Now, as the year comes to an end, I want to reflect on the year we've just had. One, it has gone too fast and we've lost so many people from COVID and it isn't getting any better with this new Omicron variant. So I want to thank you for your support and allow me and the team a chance to come into your homes each week with the most important, inspiring stories from around the world. None of this would have been possible without the beautiful team behind the scenes. They know who they are. So for me, a big thank you to them and to you. I'm really excited uh, that we'll bring you similar programs in 2022. So I hope you enjoy the time off with your families, look after your neighbours and the elderly, and don't forget to get the booster as it will protect you. Have a great time in Christmas and New Year. I hope you have a great New Year. See you in 2022. Good night. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.